Welcome to The Elephant. I'm Kevin Kaners. Today, we're talking with Yeb Sanyo. Yeb Sanyo, for years, was the lead negotiator for the Philippines. But he first gained international prominence in 2013, when at COP21 in Warsaw, he delivered an emotional plea to his fellow delegates to put aside their differences and commit to taking meaningful action on climate change. At the time he gave the speech, Super Typhoon Haiyan was devastating the Philippines. It caused over 6,000 deaths and left millions of people homeless. It was one of the most powerful storms ever recorded in history, and it's the type that scientists say will become more frequent and stronger as the effects of climate change worsen. Here's an excerpt of the speech he gave. My country is being tested by this hailstorm called Super Typhoon Haiyan. The initial assessment showed that Haiyan left a wake of massive destruction that is unprecedented, unthinkable, and horrific. I speak for my delegation, but I, I speak, speak for the countless people who will no longer be able to speak for themselves we can take drastic action now to ensure that we prevent a future where super typhoons become a way of life. Mr. President, in Doha, we asked, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? But here, in Warsaw, we may very well ask these same four trite questions. What my country is going through as a result of this extreme climate event is madness. The climate crisis is madness. Mr. President, we can stop this madness right here in Warsaw. I still believe we can. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. That speech got Yeb a standing ovation from his fellow delegates. And at the end of it, he also announced he was going on a hunger strike during the COP until that meaningful action was taken. Yeb Senyo is no longer on the official negotiating team for the Philippines, but he hasn't stopped speaking out about the urgent need for action. This year, he walked from Rome to Paris for the People's Pilgrimage, an interfaith community calling for the world to come together to solve the crisis. After completing their 1500 kilometer journey, the People's Pilgrimage arrived in Paris yesterday. But I reached Yeb Sanyo last week while he was still on the road to speak to him about why he was walking and how he felt going into Paris. Here's a conversation. Hello. Hello. Hello, Yeb Sanyo here. Hi Yeb, how are you? I'm, I'm doing fine. First, um, where are you right now? Um, we just arrived in a, a small town. I'm still trying to determine our exact location. We have just uh, actually, in fact, arrived just now. And uh, it's, uh, I, I, I think this is about 300 kilometers from Paris. Okay, and, and so you're in, you're in a small town in France? Yes, in France. And so you've been you've been walking for for how many days now? It, you you started off in um, in Rome, right? Yeah, uh, we have been walking for forty nine days now. And how's it been? <laughs> has it been uh, has it been tough? Has it been cold? Oh, it's it's been an amazing day so far. We've met a lot of uh, great people along the way. The weather has been unusually, according to the people we've met, unusually cooperative for this time of the year. We were able to cross the St. Great Bernard Pass, the highest pass between Italy and, and uh, Switzerland in the Alps, without much trouble. I mean, there's supposed to be thick snow up there by now, but uh, when we crossed it at uh, the start of November, we, we were able to cross it quite easily. It's been warm, unusually warm, as uh, we are told, and this is actually pleasantly warm for uh, a lot of the Filipinos who are on this journey as well. Hmm. So uh, makes it makes it easier, but perhaps a, a worrying sign. Yes, yes, it's uh, been easy for us uh, relatively um, in terms of the weather, um, but a lot of people are yes, indeed, are telling us uh, that uh, this is not a good sign with respect to 
uh, what should be the usual weather by this time of the year. So, so why did you decide to undertake this journey? Um, this journey is for me a continuation of uh, the journey we made last year in the Philippines, 1,000 kilometers from Manila to Tacloban uh, to commemorate the first anniversary of the super typhoon and the devastation it left. And um, this is uh, primarily the reason why we are walking from Rome to Paris to raise the urgent call for action on climate change and hoping uh, that we can also carry a message of hope. How have you been received on, on the road when you when you stop in, in various towns? In uh, mostly, uh, mostly the welcome has been quite heartwarming with uh, a lot of people welcoming us into each town and more people sending us off on each day. Uh, of course, it varies from day to day, but we've had some really fantastic uh, time in uh, many of the cities we've been to, Lyon in particular and Geneva were really um, amazing towns uh, as well as um, Milan and uh, some small towns in Italy. Um, it's been it's been truly amazing and heartwarming to see so many people. It's been very encouraging for us to see so many people becoming very receptive to this journey, to this pilgrimage, and also seeing and hearing a lot of people talk about climate change in a very profound way that uh, gives us a lot of uh, inspiration as well as we continue with the journey. How, how many are there of you actually undertaking the, the walk? Currently, there's already 25 of us. So there were 12 of us uh, who left Rome, and uh, it has more than doubled. And But uh, this is the number of people who comprise what we call the core pilgrims who walk from day to day. But there's been hundreds uh, who have been walking with us on certain days uh, just to accompany us uh, in their own towns. Now, as as you mentioned, it the idea behind the walk is to to raise awareness, to to bring about the sense of urgency that climate change demands. Now, you first came to international prominence uh, because of a, a speech you gave two years ago in Warsaw at uh, COP nineteen, where you made a passionate plea for the delegates to put down the differences and to actually commit to solving the the climate crisis. Can you give me a bit of background behind that speech? What was going on? What you were feeling at the time? Yes, it can be recalled that uh, on November 11th, that's more than two years uh, ago, um, I was given that rare, unique opportunity to speak on behalf of my country with uh, some extraordinary circumstances, because those, that was just three days after Super Typhoon Haiyan, the strongest storm ever recorded to make landfall in any country, had hit the Philippines. And um, during that time, the disaster had become very personal to me as it hit my father's hometown. And with li- very little information uh, giving us any reassurance that things were were fine, and uh, it uh, it was uh, a bleak uh, story that was unfolding. And uh, my own brother was trapped in Tacloban City that time, and I haven't had a chance to even communicate with him uh, in the aftermath of the storm. And uh, we were not we were we were quite unsure what what befell him. So. And then, and so at that time when I gave the speech, uh, a lot of the speech was, of course, prepared as a as a written speech. But uh, I ended up uh, going off script for for a moment, and I tried to control my my emotions. But uh, the situation got the better of me, and uh, I ended up I ended up <coughs> I ended up crying and becoming very emotional. Can you tell me about the actual the scale of the storm that that hit the Philippines, Haiyan? Yes, the the storm had devastated so many homes. Uh, it had affected more than one million homes. It uh, reportedly, uh, officially killed more than six thousand people, and with uh, more than a thousand missing. But a lot of uh, reports from the ground show that there could have been more than fifteen thousand people killed by the storm, and. Uh, it caused a massive devastation also in the agriculture sector, uh, causing a lot of damage to crops and property. And uh, it has now become recorded as the biggest disaster the Philippines has ever experienced. It's still hard to attribute things to climate change with specific weather events, but uh, 
Super Typhoon Haiyan is off the charts, and even even the IPCC in their reports have said that uh, there will be more intense storms with warmer oceans, and uh, this is merely a preview of things to come. And I would think that uh, the intensity of storms that, that the Philippines is experiencing now is not some freak event happening, but uh, starting to show patterns with uh, one super typhoon after another each year. And uh, quite interestingly, it is happening uh, almost at the same time as uh, the climate summits are, are being being held. Now, at the end of that, that speech, you announced that you were going to go on a hunger strike until uh, meaningful targets were achieved, until the delegates actually achieved what they, they were there to do. And you also got a standing ovation from that speech. What actually happened afterwards? Did did you get the results you were hoping for? Um, in, indeed, I declared that I would uh, abstain from food and go on fasting until we see we, until I saw progress uh, in the negotiations. Um, it was not the ultimate outcome that we were hoping for, and th- that's why I ended up not eating soon enough and uh, having to finish the whole conference uh, without food, but. We did end up with the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, which was one of the outcomes we were really fighting for. And having gotten that has given us at least some sense of consolation around the outcome of Warsaw. It's far from what is needed to avert the climate crisis, but uh, as a negotiator, then one of the things always on our mind is just to live and fight another day. And uh, that's how things ended then. Now, that was uh, COP19 that you gave that, that speech at in Warsaw. Now we're coming up on, on COP21 in Paris. I mean, that number, 21, that's how many of these these meetings we've, we've had, the Conference of the Parties uh, since uh, Berlin in 1995. And, and yet global emissions have, have only gone up. Why, why is it so difficult for these things to actually succeed or to bring about the change that you know, ostensibly they're, they're there to bring about. Is it, is it that the delegates don't care? Is it just that the process is really difficult? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, first of all, I don't think it's, that the, it's not that the delegates don't care. Delegates, delegates are soldiers. They follow orders. Uh, they, they, carry, they carry positions that their government have thought through, and it's a case of governments being highly influenced by vested interests and that is uh, the, one of the main reasons why the climate negotiations do not progress as fast as we, we we would want it to be there is a lot of influence that prevents progress and a lot of influence that pr- prevents the global economy from being transformed from the dirty way that we develop uh, into a way that can uh, allow development to to happen in a, a more equitable way and in a way that, that that takes care of the environment. So you mean because there's so many powerful entrenched interests involved and, and those interests have the, the ear of their, their governments, that those governments then aren't that enthusiastic to actually take the steps required or or might even at times block progress from, from occurring? Yes, I would think so. I would think that uh, many governments are constrained by powerful global interests uh, a powerful industry interests as well, and uh, that's why they their their hands are tied. And uh, progress in terms of what needs to be done for international climate policy uh, is stalled because of that. And uh, we have seen that becoming more enhanced in uh, previous years when even corporate entities sponsor conference of the parties, and that's very troubling. In fact. What is it like actually being there as a, as a delegate? Can you give us a sense for those of us outside of it um, what it was like to to actually be a negotiator? Yeah. Well, mo- most of the time, being a negotiator involves endless meetings. Uh, we start, of course, with uh, obligatory plenary sessions. And then when we talk about specific outcomes, uh, for example, COP21 in Paris is an, what we call an outcome conference, where which is which means there is a deadline to come up with something, and that something right now is an agreement uh, which uh, we agreed to pursue in 2011 in in Durban in South Africa. And so when we have such a deadline, we work very hard as delegates to actually agree on text as if we are formulating a treaty and 
uh, finding the words, and that would be mainly legal legal text that would go into the agreement. And so there's a lot of uh, back and forth around that, and uh, that, that is when we start arguing whether, where to place even a comma or a period or a semicolon, uh, and it becomes dreary work, and uh, I would even uh, say that sometimes it feels very a very convoluted process when even uh, agreeing on where to put the comma becomes an endless task, and th- that is basically what we do. We're human beings as well, so we need rest, we need we need food, and so there are designated breaks and lunch breaks, and uh, we are technically not supposed to meet beyond 6 p.m. based on the rules we agreed to, but in most of the conferences, we've been overshooting all of these time limits and in most of the cops, there have been a lot of sessions that go deep into the night and even into the wee hours of the morning just to hack out a feasible outcome that uh, would be acceptable to everyone and uh, that is something that's very hard to do when you have 196 countries on the table. I mean, I imagine it must be kind of startling on the one hand to have something that is so urgent as climate change and we've been procrastinating for so long on really taking the type of action required. And on the other hand, having spending days or years really in the end debating words and paragraphs and where to place a comma. Was that frustrating for you when you were the negotiator? Um, that is that is indeed frustrating for me as a negotiator. But what is more frustrating is when when countries, when governments lose the big picture. Um, it's part of the territory. It's part of my job to belabor things uh, with respect to what uh, text or where where to, where to put the comma. I mean that, that's part of the territory. But uh, what frustrates me uh, a lot uh, even more is. Uh, when I know that the red lines of each country are based on vested interests, on very narrow uh, vested interests uh, or quite narrow national interests, and they lose sight of the big picture that climate change is a crisis that affects the whole world and that uh, will affect the future so in very profound ways. And when they fail to think about that and reflect about that and allow themselves to think of the big picture it's uh, very frustrating. I mean, given that, as you say, the governments uh, represent oftentimes vested interests in terms of the the policy that they take to the UN or the strategy that they take to these UN meetings. I mean, how can we get around that? That seems like a, a really difficult issue. If even, you know, one country decides that they don't want to play a constructive role, it seems like that could stop everything or at least really slow things down. Yeah, and uh, that that is indeed a, a very big challenge, and I don't think I have the answer to that. It's uh, it's something that uh, I, it, it's a, it's a question that I don't think I can find the answer within the context of the multilateral process, and, and that is probably why I decided to get out of it um, because I believe that to solve climate change, uh, it's the, the time to wait for the world leaders to decide for us is over and um, people in communities can start building a another world where we solve climate change uh, it is happening already and it's, it's, it's about fostering all of these solutions uh, and making them happen in a in a broader sense and in, in a more massive way in a faster way so so you would say that uh, for those of us concerned about climate change we shouldn't pin all, all our hopes on this process the un process we should we we can start uh, tackling it in, in other ways while we wait for them to come together? Definitely. Uh, I think it's a question of scale. And uh, if, if we're waiting for the international scale in terms of policy and solutions, uh, that might come too late. And so we, we need to start in our cities, in our towns, in each organization. And we see in many institutions now divesting from fossil fuels. That That is part of the solution. And uh, if we can start doing that without waiting for policy signals at the international level, then we can we can start sending the right signals from the from the ground and from the grassroots, and uh, it it can change the world in many ways. So I'm I'm pinning my hopes on that because things happen faster when people really uh, care about the issue and uh, find concrete solutions that are immediately applied. So I'm still hopeful and optimistic about that. What, what do you think is important for regular people to understand about uh, what goes on at Paris? Like, what what should we be looking for, and what should we understand about it when uh, we're looking from the outside? 
Um, first of all, I think people should not look at this climate summit as the end all of uh, the fate of humanity would be defined. They should not even be looked at as uh, ultimate deadlines. They should be merely looked at as some international process that where we can prevent further damage done by politicians to the well-being of the world. But uh, for example, for Paris, Paris should not be seen as a, a deadline for all. For humanity, it should be perhaps uh, seen as an, a milestone. But beyond Paris, we need to foster solutions uh, if we truly care deeply about solving climate change. And with with these conferences, we uh, must, of course, not be overly pessimistic about the outcome. But in in many ways it must be seen as being able to strengthen a, the global movement for change and transformation. And are you optimistic that that might happen? Has the has the momentum shifted at all since uh, the last COP or since Warsaw? What I have not seen before, and this is quite unprecedented, is how faith communities are weighing in on the climate issue. And that gives me a lot of enthusiasm. It... Uh, is so inspiring to see faith leaders take on this uh, this crisis, this issue head on, with uh, almost every major spiritual tradition speaking about climate change in a very strong way, uh, especially this year. And you know, I, I would just be curious about what keeps you going. I mean, you've obviously committed yourself to working on this issue. It, it can't be easy, given the failure and this the slow moving disaster that we're we're facing how do you keep going in the face of what seems like at times very very slow progress um you you mean in the in the formal process no i mean in your own life in terms of mm-hmm. you know doing this this walk and and spending your mm-hmm. time speaking out about climate change and trying to wear raise awareness what what keeps you going mm-hmm. with doing that I, I truly believe in the power of, of this journey. I, I believe in the power of walking uh, as it can transform people and it can plant seeds. I have no illusion that I will see the seeds grow in my lifetime, but uh, it's a leap of faith. And as long as we plant seeds and we we allow people to see the reality that climate crisis is, uh, th- that's that's what I hold on to. And... I don't have any illusions that world leaders would change their minds overnight, but uh, we will keep trying. And I think the message really is for us to be able to connect to people. That's why we have embarked on this walk, because walking allows us to connect with people, to connect with nature. And uh, it is largely symbolic, but uh, as we realize in this journey that's been on for close to 50 days, uh, it has not just been symbolic, but uh, we have truly been able to engage with communities. And uh, we have seen a lot of good examples as well in the three countries that we've uh, been walking in. And this uh, has also been an example of how the human family can be strengthened and, and unified. On this walk, we have different faiths, different nationalities, different culture, cultural backgrounds, and we are united in purpose and we see ourselves as one family and that's what we try to promote. If and if nothing happens in Paris, or it, it seems to just kick the ball down the road a bit more, what then? Will you, what will your next step be? Will you continue uh, working on this? Should uh, should we all be worried if if nothing comes out? No, I'm not worried about the outcome of Paris because the outcome of Paris is quite predictable. Uh, what we are praying for is a miracle in Paris, but if that mir- miracle does not come come forth. Um, we continue with a journey, a journey that's not merely literal, but uh, a journey that allows us to continue connecting with people and uh, hoping that uh, the global uh, movement for confronting the climate crisis would, would just go larger and, uh, and, and become stronger. And, uh, and I think it can be done through formal institutions, through cities and towns and villages, because we have proven on this journey that uh, it is truly happening. Uh, the kind of uh, aspiration that we all share is uh, shared by many. So we're not losing hope and uh, we will go on with this journey. And um, 
continue connecting with people. I, I guess to, to solve a, a problem of, you know, truly global proportions, it, it takes all of us doing many different different things to tackle it. That's true. That's true. That's very true. And uh, I, I guess uh, with with this with this uh, issue, the defining issue of our generation, it will take all of us uh, to find the answer. And um, I know that uh, sometimes climate change is seen as a secondary issue, but uh, it is the defining issue of our generation. And uh, I am pretty sure that uh, it will force us um, to bring out the best in humanity and uh, eventually each society will have to confront it uh, in a very compelling way. And so uh, it can also be the, the be the issue that will unite us in purpose. Well, Yeb Sanyo, thanks so much for talking to us today and uh, all your work on this issue. We'll, uh, we'll see you in Paris. Thank you, Esprel. It's my pleasure. That was Yeb Sanyo, a climate change activist and the former lead negotiator for the Philippines at the United Nations process. Yeb, along with his fellow pilgrims, arrived in Paris yesterday after their 1,500-kilometer journey on foot. And that's all for The Elephant this time. You can find us online at elephantpodcast.org, and we're also on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at elephantpodcast. We're given support by the CKAA, a European society of entrepreneurs, scientists, students, professionals, and policy officers working to create a climate resilient society. Find out more at ckaa.eu. And tomorrow we'll be back with a new episode featuring a conversation with Elizabeth May, environmental activist and the leader of the Green Party of Canada. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you then.